Booze and Barbecue. Hello and welcome to Boost Booze and Barbecue. This is Andy, and I am happy to have you guys here today. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for coming along on the ride. I sure do appreciate it. We've been having a lot of fun and doing some really cool stuff here, too. First and foremost, I wanted to let everyone know that we have a winner for the t-shirt giveaway. I really hope I'm going to say this gentleman's name right, Mike Kakushk. You have won a new t-shirt from Boost Booze and Barbecue, my friend. I will be sending you a message through Facebook, Instagram, you know, all the good stuff. But if you're listening, then that's even better and hopefully a little bit more of uh, a surprise for you. So congrats, my friend. Thank you for the review. And you guys, all it takes to be entered to win one of these t-shirts is to go out and like, rate, review on either iTunes or or on the Facebook page. So get on it. It's easy to do. And you could win a free t-shirt from the Boost Booze and Barbecue crew. And it's kind of funny. I'll be curious to see what shirt he picks because we do have a lineup. We've got a few. (laughs) And I'm always curious to see which shirts people choose. You know what I'm saying? I mean, sometimes it's the show shirt and sometimes it's one of the other designs that we have, but it's always fun. It gives me a good little insight into why a person is listening to our show. It's just kind of a fun thing that I like to do. And we just really appreciate you guys tuning in. And I really appreciate the ability to do this every single week. It's been a ton of fun. We haven't missed one yet. I I will admit last week we had a replay from Pardon My Fork that I thought you guys would really like. We had that incredible interview with LC May from Clyde May's Whiskey. I just, I really love talking to that guy. He's super impressive with his knowledge and, and very informative and very fun, very fun to talk to. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. And actually it reminds me that we're going to be starting a third show here real soon. I don't know where I'm coming up with the time or the energy for it, but uh, we're going to try it. We're going to do it. We have uh, Pardon My Fork, the the sister show to this one, over on the Spoonie Radio Network, and I am in talks and working things out for doing a booze-only show. As some of you know, it's a segment that I like to call Small Batch, and we do it once in a while. It's a lot of fun for me. It's a lot of fun for the guest and it's a lot of fun for you guys listening at home. And we're able to, you know, find some of the more prominent Oregon boozes, beers, wines, whiskeys, that sort of thing. And I really enjoy highlighting those people. I feel like they need to get more coverage than they do because, man, we've just got so much good stuff here in Oregon. And I'm afraid that so much of it gets missed and skipped over. And so I I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to highlight a lot of those folks. And we're going to go outside of the Willamette Valley, too. We're going to go all over the country, uh, probably all over the world. And I really look forward to taking you guys along on the ride for that it hopefully will be done most of the time with friend of mine, friend of the show, Chris Lopez, the wine club manager over at Archery Summit Vineyard. He has got quite the head on him for this stuff. It's very impressive, his knowledge base. So he's going to bring a lot to the table, and I really appreciate him doing that. Uh, it's it's going to make for some really interesting conversation, I think. We've already recorded a couple Uh, And it's been good. It's been good. Just recording a few as kind of a warm up, a tester, see how we interact, how we talk about this stuff, whether or not we can kind of be on the same page while we're talking about it. And I'm happy to report that he and I are very simpatico on almost everything. You can't have a good show with people that 100 percent agree with each other 100 percent of the time. Every time, you know, you got to mix it up a little bit, but that comes down to the change in palates and the change in flavors and the way that you taste things. We talk about that once in a while on this show, you know, and uh, speaking of today's episode is being brought to you, not by, I shouldn't say that, but with the New Holland Brewing Dragon's Milk Barrel Age Stout. I love this stuff. It is so good. Big bold, roasty, toasty, malty. You got to be a little careful with it because it is 11% alcohol. And this is a thick beer. You know, we talk once in a while about mouthfeel. This has a very rich, dark, roasty, thick mouthfeel. And so you need to, first of all, put your, pull your mind out of the gutter. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a beer here. 
But this, you have to kind of keep in the back of your mind that that's what this beer is all about. You know, some people say they don't like dark beers. And some people don't like dark beers because they've only ever had, you know, Guinness, for example, which is kind of the light beers of, of dark beers. But something like this is so big and so bold. It's it's more like a red wine than it is a beer because it's just got so much complexity, so much flavor. There's so much going on. And so you need to be able to kind of take your time and appreciate it. If you're looking for a beer to just chug. This is not it. You know, this is the kind of beer where you pour it into a small glass, something that comes to a head and uh, you need to be able to smell it. You need to be able to engage with it. It's a lot of fun being able to drink something like this when you're around other people that appreciate good beer and you guys can kind of talk about it and dissect it. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. It's something that I really like to do and appreciate about my friends when we can do it. So cheers to you and cheers to them and cheers to New Holland Brewing because this stuff is incredible. All right. So as some of you know, I was sick last week. Uh, I had a real bad flu, man. It was crazy. I just, I spent a couple of days not really feeling that great. Thought, oh, I got a cold coming on, whatever. It's not that big of a deal. And then over at Pardon My Fork, I had this incredible opportunity to interview Simon Majumdar, a very popular Food Network host, judge, a well-known food critic. The dude's just been all over the place, and I was so excited to be able to talk to him. But, man, I really had a hard time during the interview. It was just a struggle to, like, come up with the words and, and kick anything out of my mouth. And when I was finally done, and he was so understanding and I told him I'm so sorry I just have this cough and I keep getting this frog in my throat and I'm really really sorry and he was super understanding what just a gem of a dude it's no wonder that he's so successful at any rate we finished our conversation and I went to lay down I just thought man I do not feel good and you know my head was hot but my body was cold and so I just randomly grabbed my ear thermometer and it came back 101 I had just interviewed one of the more prominent voices on the Food Network with a 101 fever. I just thought, oh my gosh, what is this thing going to sound like when I go back and listen to it? But you know what? It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. I was actually pretty happy with the result. We're going to be releasing that on Friday, 1 p.m. as normal on Pardon My Fork. You're also going to be able to catch it on the Spoonie Radio Network, which is something that we recently joined with Pardon My Fork. You can find them at Spoonie.com and at Spoonie Radio on Facebook. They're doing a ton of cool stuff over there. I'm having a lot of fun doing it. And man, the people that I've been able to meet and talk to, longtime friend of the show, Chef Mark Conway, he has got his own daily show going on over there called Family Meal. And that has been a lot of fun to listen to. Very cool guy and a lot of really cool guess it's really shocking who he's been able to get Uh, as a matter of fact one of his first episodes was with the white house chef one of the white house chefs they've got a few but that was a really incredible conversation and uh you know he talks about the the dude's a veteran he was in the navy he has a fund that he works with to help uh, veterans, combat vets, families of combat vets. It's very cool stuff. I really recommend that you go and check that out. He's on all of the regular podcast stuff, just like we are. You can find us anywhere, you know, Radio Public and and Pocket Cast and Player FM and, of course, iTunes and Spotify and stuff like that. So he's out there. Go and check him out. If you're into the food side, you're going to have a lot of fun listening to him. But That's enough of that food stuff. One thing that I wanted to touch on real quick before we roll into a couple of guests that we had, I am kind of shocked at BMW, to be honest, not kind of shocked. I'm really shocked. So we all know that the new BMW X1, not new, but, but it's been around for a little while. The BMW X1 is a front wheel drive platform. And man, everybody's just been like, what are you doing, BMW? Why would you do that? That's terrible. Don't make anything front wheel drive. You need to stick with rear wheel drive. We don't want to see anything front wheel drive. Well, BMW is telling you, uh, don't care. We're going to do our own thing. And they have just announced that the two series four door car is going to be a front wheel drive platform. Their two door coupe and convertible uh, 
uh, two series are still going to be rear wheel drive, but that that two series four door is going to be a front wheel drive platform. And man, I'm not sure how to feel about that. Honestly, I'm I'm really not sure how to feel about it. I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are. Let me know, you know, leave a comment. Of course, this is all going to get posted on Facebook and Instagram and everything. I'll tell you, though, for me, it feels weird. It feels weird. I'm not like a huge BMW guy, but it's just kind of a, I don't know, it's an odd feeling, you know, uh, the, the current one series sedan in China is front wheel drive. They've been kind of experimenting with that over there. So we can anticipate more of this stuff coming, more of it's going to happen. And, you know, I understand the implication is BMW is trying to stay with the times. We've got a more classically fiscally conservative movement that's happening. People don't seem to have money. They don't seem to be wanting to spend money. And BMW, instead of just trying to compete with that upper echelon of vehicles, you know, BMW, Mercedes, Aston Martin, whatever, that sort of thing, they're trying to cut down a little bit. You know, I would anticipate this front wheel drive four door two series I, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if it started in like the high 20s and, you know, a Mazda 6 sedan, something that is very well equipped, might be in the same range. And so I think they might be trying to dip their ladle down a little further than they used to. You know, they're they're trying to capture some of the. I don't know, some of the customer base, I guess you might say, from the economy division. And that's kind of a weird thing. You know, there really aren't any bad cars on the market anymore when you think about it. We we all have our biases and we all have our opinions. I, I get that. And I'm probably going to get some hate. People going, well, of course, there are bad cars out there, you know. But uh, I'll tell you, my wife fell in love with the Hyundai Elantra. And it was the latest one. She has a 2017. And it it's like a... It's a loaded, but it's missing a few things. It was like a downgrade from the loaded. I can't remember what the loaded one is. I think it's a, an Elantra, um, yeah, an Elantra Sport. The Elantra GT is the five-door hatchback, but the Elantra Sport, I think, is the 17-inch wheels and the leather and all of that. I actually went a step below that because she didn't want the black leather interior and she didn't want the stitching on the steering wheel and stuff like that. Like She wanted, she wanted cloth. Uh, obviously we have a little bit of a hobby farm going on here. And she just said, I don't want to try to keep this leather clean. I'm going to ruin it in a couple of years. So let's just do cloth. That'll make everything easy. But I, I still retained the heated front seats, the backup camera, the power, everything, power, everything, a super nice stereo system, like all of that stuff. And I, I spent some time haggling, you know, the, the starting price for that vehicle was not bad at all. It was like 23,000. And I spent most of the day in the Hyundai dealership haggling back and forth with those guys. And a pro tip, by the way, whenever you walk into a dealership and they go, oh no, we don't haggle because this, the price is just what the price is and we don't make a commission. It's total BS. If you sit in there for seven hours, like I did, they will come down in price. I ended up driving that thing off the lot for 17, seven or 17, five, something like that. But heck of a good deal. Really good deal. It's been a great car. She regularly, regularly, and I'm talking around town, gets 37, 38 miles a gallon, 39 miles a gallon. Mixed driving is right around 40. I drove it to, well, let's just say I, I drove it about 120 mile round trip and I ended up getting 44 miles to the gallon. And I was just stunned. I was just like, what? What is going on with this thing? Like, it's not, it doesn't have a ton of power, but it's not gutless. And I don't know, it, it rides really well. I just, I never would expect that out of a car of that caliber. I mean, I still have this mindset of the Hyundais from the late eighties, early nineties, same with the Kias, you know, that sort of thing. And, and that's just not, it's not the way it is anymore. It, it's wild. The Kia Stinger is one of the best performance sedans out there right now with that twin turbo 3.3 V6. It's cranking out a ton of power. It now comes in an all-wheel drive model. You've heard Koi and I talk about it on the show before. I don't know. It just It's like these lower-end, air quotes, lower-end automotive companies have raised what they're doing to the point 
where I feel like BMW is starting to feel that pressure of, man, we got to punch down a little bit because they're really starting to reach up. You know, you start looking at more of the Hyundai lineup. You think about the Veloster in and the I-30 race car and not to mention their Genesis line. I mean, look at what Hyundai is doing lately. And that's not that's totally separate from Kia. You know, we always try to compare those two in the same realm because they kind of came up at the same time. You know, I think a lot of my listeners were kids when Hyundai and Kia were really kind of, they were names, they were known, but they were used more as slurs, sort of like if you told somebody it was a Daewoo or a Daihatsu, you know, and the the funny thing about it is Daihatsu is a huge brand name in other parts of the world. We just, we kind of got the uh, barrel dregs. It's a weird thing. Anyway, it, that's besides the point. The point is you have got some of these really interesting, fun, incredible and incredibly well equipped vehicles coming from what people traditionally think of as the quote unquote bottom of the barrel, you know, scraping the dregs. It, it just that's not these manufacturers anymore. It's it's pretty shocking to me, if I'm being totally honest, it's it's shocking to see where they came from and where they've landed. I suppose it's not shocking if you look at their history anywhere else in the world. I mean, we've all seen the containers that say Hyundai on the side. We've all seen the forklifts that say Hyundai on the side. I mean, Hyundai is not a small company. It is a global conglomerate. But as far as their cars are concerned, just the the quality has ramped up so much, it feels like, in the last 10 or 15 years. And especially just even in the last five years, they've really come into their own. And they're hitting their stride, and they are a serious competitor on the U.S. market. It's it's really surprising. Anyways, I'm getting way off, off topic and sidetracked. Uh, the only reason why I'm talking about this is because there is a direct comparison to this stuff to what BMW is trying to do. You know, I'm sure BMW is looking at it as punching down. I know I do. But having said that, it kind of isn't. You know, you look at the quality of these cars and it's just so high. I don't know, man. It's hard to call that punching down when the quality of the cars below you have gotten so good. It's almost like their quality has risen to match the bottom end of BMW. You know what I'm talking about? It doesn't really change the fact that I love seeing the smaller turbocharged rear wheel drive BMWs. That is a niche of fun. That's that's strictly what those cars are for. A small, fast, light, balanced, turbocharged car. It's the reason why the FRS BRZ is so popular. It's the reason why the Miata is so popular. It's the reason why you still have sports cars, small sports cars, lightweight sports cars that are still in production that are so fun and so popular because that's just a it's something that really lets the driver connect to the road. You know, of course you can run out and get that M5 that's got 500 horsepower, whatever it is. But sometimes that's too much. Sometimes that's a little bit too numbing. Yes, it's comfortable. Yes, it's fast. It's all of those things. But are you really feeling connected to the car, to the road? Do you know what I'm talking about? Like maybe I'm way off base. You guys can let me know. But uh, at any rate, we are going to roll into a couple of calls we took, and I want to get right into it. I recorded a call-in show here a while back, and then I randomly had somebody that was able to do a full show, and I really wanted to get them out. Tony Barthel over at the Curbside Car Show Calendar Podcast. It was so much fun talking to him. What a cool dude. And actually, I'm an avid listener of his show. I highly recommend that you guys go out and check it out. It's very cool. If you're into classic cars, he and his co-host do some really deep dives and i just love that stuff it feels very educational but in a fun way they're very good at talking about that stuff so make sure you go and check them out curbside classic car show calendar excuse me curbside car show calendar Uh, they do a lot of classic car show stuff so you know just type that into itunes spotify radio public wherever you find those and uh, they'll be there it's very cool stuff and uh at any rate I wanted to get back around to Vincent. He's a friend of mine, longtime friend of mine, huge car guy, um, also a videographer here in Portland. 
And so I had some really fun stuff to talk about. Uh, the topic of the day was car chase scenes or car movies. What's your favorite? And he kind of blew my mind, actually. I mean, we all know what the number one car movie was that everyone thinks about. Are you ready to say it with me? One, two, three, Fast and the Furious. That is what every single person said. They were like, all right, you want to know the car movie that got me into cars? It was the Fast and the Furious. And I had to lean away from the microphone, make a little vomit sound, and uh, and then come back around to it. Hey, listen, I watched the Fast and the Furious when I was young, you know, that, and that's fine. I was already street racing at the time. And so the only thing that I really remember about that time with the Fast and the Furious is suddenly showing up to our normal spot, which normally had, I don't know, six, seven, eight people, a dozen people. And there were like, I don't know, 40 cars there that were all parked at diagonal. And I didn't want any part of it. I just thought, no, this is the, the cops are going to come rolling in here real quick. And I don't want any part of this. I don't want to be seen with it. And so it, it put a weird damper on the street racing scene for a little while, probably a year, actually. But we picked it back up. Uh, Koi got old enough and, and had his fast civic hatchback and everything. And so we went and started picking it back up again. It, it faded out. You know, a lot of people realized, oh, it's not quite like it is in the movies. Uh, my car isn't fast. And also, even though it's not fast, the police will still write me a fat ticket. And so thankfully it died off. And also, thankfully, the Fast and the Furious franchise turned into a shoot 'em up action movie instead of a car movie. And so people kind of moved on from there. But, you know, I concede it is the quintessential defining car guy movie of the early 2000s. There. Fine. I said it. Can we please move on? Yes, we can. Here's Vincent talking about some really cool stuff he found out about one of the Fast and the Furious movies. I don't even remember which one it is. It's it's one of the action-y ones, so it's probably four or higher. Do we call the Toyota Drift, Toyota Drift, Tokyo Drift movie part of the franchise? I know a lot of people wanted to not consider it canonized, but arguably it's the best Fast and the Furious movie out there. I don't know. Let me know. Throw me a comment. Let me let me know what you think. Should it be left in? Should it be left out? Didn't really have anything to do with any of the other movies, but, you know, here we are. It's still the more entertaining one, in my opinion. At any rate, here's Vincent to talk about his thoughts. Vincent, longtime friend of mine. How are you doing, son? Not bad. How about you, Andy? Doing good, man. So today's topic is uh, car movies and car movie or car chase scenes, rather. Nice. What do you What do you thinking? The first thing I think about is car scenes that I, I I always thought were fake, but then I I found out later that they were they're they were pretty damn real. Like um, particularly in you never know in like Fast and Furious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Remember Fast Five where they have those vaults around. Mm. There, there's like the two Dodge Chargers and they're like pulling the bolt around. I remember the scene. I never actually watched the whole movie, but I remember the scene. Oh, yeah. So it's like a super dangerous looking scene. You know, there's these two Dodge Chargers pulling around like this hundreds of pounds of weight, if not like thousands, bolt thing that they're that the Chargers are holding on with with like cables. And I was like, there's no way that actually went on the street. And they actually pulled that around and had like these two cars in tandem pulling it. But I, I was I was reading some interviews and I guess the whole thing was um like real. Like they actually pulled a vault on the street and they had to have these cars and the you know, the, the vault being loosely tied with, with strings and not taut or, or cables or whatever, it actually swung around and broke stuff. What? Really? Yeah, um it's crazy. I I think there might be some drawings. I'm not sure if there's like really good behind the scenes footage. But they 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 built it, like um they they built a container and mm -hmm. um some of I think there's like they had to build like four or five examples. Um, some of them it's just like a an empty rolling thing, and then some of them there's like a a driver inside for some of the the slower scenes where they needed to go like a certain speed, and he he couldn't see anything. He just had to like be directed by by walkie talkie. Seriously. Yeah, and um, you know that was like on the street, like in a in a public street, not like a like a recreated area, and it had to break. I'm not sure what it, I think it breaks into like telephone poles and stuff. And you think that stuff would be so much cheaper to do just in 
and special effects, but it, I guess, for whatever reason, for like realism or um, just because it's in their budget, it ate, they decided to actually like recreate all that. What? I had no idea about any of this. And a quick disclaimer for folks. I'm not like fact checking Vincent, but he is in the film industry. So I'm probably inclined to uh, believe you. But that's nuts, man. Yeah, it's just it's interesting to see that they they go through all the trouble of building these these set pieces. And it'll like never be used again because it has that one specific purpose. And that's it. And like, you know, like hundreds of hours goes into making these things. Well, I mean, you know, that's what they did with the sets for the uh, faked moon landing. So, you know, it kind of makes sense. That's true. I like to think that there's someone out there that, that pays it a visit every once in a while and throws a party. Sure, sure. Keeps the place swept up. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I wasn't personally involved in this at all, but it just makes me think of the other implications. Like, um, these things always need insurance. Um, when you get to a high enough level, people are only participating in these things if they know they're going to be taken care of if there's an accident or or anything that went unplanned. So there's just always lots of considerations for these things. Like um, they probably had to have, get some kind of clearance with the, the city, of course. And then the, the driver inside the car, there's a lot of things that they ran into that they, inside the, the vault car that um, that they didn't think about. So like, um, he can't see anything. It's pretty enclosed, you know, to look like a real vault. And it got really hot inside because it's just basically a driver with right next to an engine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's like it's just like a tubular structure that he's in so um i think what they did was they just poured they ended up pouring dry ice over the front of the car just to, to keep everything cool inside dry ice yes so it was just like a quick solution but it's all they they had it on them so it also made everything foggy and, and like hard to see hmm. but it's all they had to keep the the driver who um apparently kept passing out because it was so hot inside. You know, what's amazing about this whole thing is, I mean, the, the budget for something like that, right? It's just outrageous, right? So like, it's such a huge budget, but at the same time, they can't afford to build anything that would give that guy more, I don't know, airflow or cooling or whatever. And they're building all of these sets that are one-off sets yeah, it just yeah, seems it, so but, weird, doesn't it? Like they, so so as far as you know, or do you know, were they running through like actual streets or like yeah, the concrete um, that I, they were tearing up? You know. Yeah. Um, so I, I think at the beginning of the whole scene is the the chargers pulling the vault out of the wall, and um, so to to get like the giant metal object to 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 be able to float across the ground and look like it's actually being pulled. Um, they covered it in, I think, some kind of plastic. And it really sounded like it was a, uh, what is that material that they make shift knobs out of? You know, like the, the white plastic ones that are Delrin. Oh, they yeah. covered the, the ground in Delrin. They um, covered so the ground would, in Delrin. Yeah, either the ground or the vault or maybe both, um, but somewhere where you're not able to see it. You know, so that the the vault could be pulled easily. But they oh, actually, I gotcha. It, it turns, yeah, um, it worked too well, and so whenever they pulled it, it would go too fast, and they wouldn't be able to control it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I want to say that's why they ended up having a driver inside with like brakes and and power. Hmm. Yeah. Um. And I'm pretty sure they didn't take too many takes of those scenes um because they only had like one shot there's there's a couple shots where where the vault is tumbling and so that's the the vault they made that doesn't have someone in it of course so they didn't know where it was going to go either they just had like a general idea and they're just like have these these stunt people extras in the background they're just like well stay away from wherever the vault goes <laughs> <laughs> With all of the safety stuff that they talk about on the movie set, that's ridiculous. I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's it's awesome to think that um, you know, in high budget things, you're paying the right people, and they're like they all they really need to have is their certifications and and insurance, and you can pretty much do whatever you want as long as you know someone has it in writing. Now remind me, was five. 
that was beyond the point of where it really stopped becoming a car movie and it became more of like a shoot 'em up movie, right? Was it? Four? Yeah, like um, I think you're right. I think it's about five where it starts resembling more of like a heist movie, like Ocean's Eleven, that in Gone in Sixty Seconds, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. That is interesting, huh? Yeah. Um, let's see. I think it's the first movie that the first movie doesn't have a lot of CGI, but I, I think the second one they they kind of gave up, and the, there's a lot of really simple scenes that are CGI, like just you know a couple of cars drifting in a corner, and then you notice that the cars look cartoony for a second. Well, that has to happen sometimes, right? I mean, I'm thinking about <laughs> one of my favorite horrible movies. It's so bad that it somehow is good. Is this movie called? Uh, 200 miles per hour and it was on netflix for a while i'm i'm sure it's out there for free you're gonna you're gonna know it as soon as you see the cover of it it was just it's (laughs) it's the worst movie i've ever seen and i love it for that it's so funny but my favorite they they do a combination of terrible cgi it looks like it was rendered on a playstation 2 and then they also do like reuse of the same footage. Like they have the same car drifting the same corner. I don't know, three times, four times in the movie. It's just amazing. And uh, that's what stuff like that reminds me of. I want to say I heard about this movie and there's like, um, there's, there's maybe like a scene where a car goes around a corner and suddenly it's like, they use a different car or a different model of it. Yeah. Yeah. It it changes from, yeah, something like that. That's yeah. So the main character, yeah, the main character is driving a 240SX and then, or excuse me, an ARC-7, and then the car that is drifting in those scenes is a 240, and it really doesn't, <laughs> it really doesn't even look the same. I mean, they, they kind of try to pretend that it looks the same, but it does not. It really doesn't. That's, that's really funny. Um, but it also makes sense to me because, um, uh, uh, working across different film sets, I found out that film people are not, are not car people there. A lot of them are really interested in, in gear and, you know, sound and video equipment, but, uh, they're not so interested in, in cars. No, even when they're filming a car show, it's just kind of like, eh, yeah, I don't know. It's got cars in it. It'll be fine. And, you know, to a certain extent, they're right too. I mean, we just eat that stuff up. Don't we? I, I hate <laughs> to admit this as a self-described car guy. I uh, have not seen, I haven't seen, the fast and the furious five all the way through. And then I haven't watched any of the others. They just, it's all too ridiculous for me. Like it was quaint and it was kind of fun the first time. And then the second Uh one was interesting ish. And then the third one (laughs) where the kid goes to Japan, which might actually be the best fast and the furious. If you're going by like car ratings and then it really might be the best one. That's what I'm saying, dude. That's what I'm saying. And and I don't even know, did they ever connect back up like like that dude that was in the third one? Was he ever in any of the other ones or no? Oh wait, the the guy with the Texas accent? Uh-huh, yeah. I think he has a cameo in like the very last one or something. But yeah, he just kind of got put aside even though like all the other minor characters got to go back in like what was it? Uh um Ludicrous? Mhm. Mm-hmm. And 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 Tyrese, <laughs> yeah. they weren't even like the main character. <laughs> no, they ended up making cameos though, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. I actually feel bad for the dude that played the the main character in the third one because uh, it's like right after that movie, he lost all of his hair and he looked completely <laughs> different. So he was in a TV show. I forget what the TV show was, but it was it was years after the third Fast and the Furious. But um Real shortcut hair, bald, five o'clock shadow, but he was playing like this, uh, you know, super cop and actually doing a pretty good job. I mean, the dude's a good actor, but like as soon as he was done with that Fast and the Furious movie, he just lost all of his hair. Damn. He's got the toilet bowl going on. And I don't, I honestly felt bad for the dude, but I don't think that should have held him back at all because I mean, let's face it, he was like a 30 year old guy playing a high schooler in, in the third Fast and the Furious. I keep yeah. calling it that. I should call it Tokyo Drift because that's what people know it by. But uh, <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I would have liked to have seen more from him. I hear you. Um, 
Fast and Furious is really weird with ages, especially in the the first movie. Um, I I want to say he's, I think Paul Walker's character is is undercover, but he he has like a license that says he's like nineteen or something like that, um, or maybe in, maybe in twenties, but he's you know he's definitely not that age, and, and Vin Diesel looks way too old to be like hanging out with all these other kids. Right, that's it exactly. That's it exactly, and they're calling him like uh, super young in the first one, Paul Walker and stuff, and. Uh, that always kind of takes me out of the movies whenever they do that, <laughs> whenever they have the, the late twenties, early thirties, uh, actors and they're like, Oh yeah, we're in high school and we're a sophomore or whatever. I mean, listen, when it comes to movies like that, you've got kids, quote unquote, I'm using air quotes, doing things that really are not high school age stuff. <laughs> so obviously you can't have young actors doing that. That's, there's there's some kind of a law that would be violated there, but you know at least get some like younger ish looking actors. I don't know. That's just my personal opinion. This is true. Um, and then there's like uh, now you have a lot of. Uh, I think just now you're having a lot of actors that look a lot younger than they they actually are. Um, people can play like much younger than they are, like a uh, Natalie Portman or or Ellen Page or um, the guy, the new Spider Man guy. He looks looks like a baby yeah um, for real dude I, didn't i read something mm-hmm. that he's like 30 or maybe i'm wrong maybe he's in his mid-20s but yeah you're right he looks super young yeah um, part, part of that's but, like he's like five foot four. Ah, uh, yeah must fit in the spider-man suit well it's, <laughs> it's less material from them to make <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah most actors Strangely are that in, way yeah <laughs> Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Boom. Well, let me tell you one of my uh, favorite car scenes. This isn't yes. no this isn't necessarily a car scene per se, but you know, they tried to remake Red Dawn, right? And it uh-huh. was a, it was a flop. But one of my favorite stories from that movie is just um oh gosh. Who was the stunt driver? Uh Tanner Faust. Tanner Faust was the stunt driver really? for the movie. Yeah, yeah. And so wow. they had that pickup that was all rigged up, and the actors are sitting in the front seat, and then Tanner is in the back. He's in, like, this cage, uh-huh. and he's steering from the back, okay, from the bed, basically. Uh-huh. And so they wanted the actors in the shot, like, actually in the truck while Tanner was doing all the stuff. And so he's talking to the director, and the director's like, okay, yeah, you're going to smash through this fence and you're going to drift sideways through here and you're going to go past this pool but i want you to just you know just clip the pool like and you're going to go here and i want it to be all realistic or whatever and so (laughs) (laughs) tanner faust is one telling the story about this after the fact but uh he said they kept all of the reactions from the actors uh, in the actual movie because when he Uh was driving, you know, smash through the fence, throw it into a drift. And and he's, he's a professional driver. And so he's just thinking about, okay, how am I going to do all of this? And how is it handling and stuff? Uh But he said the actors in the front were scared absolutely to death. And we're just like all of like the screaming and crying that they're doing in the scene. (laughs) People were associating it with this swell of like emotion. Right. But apparently they have Uh to do the take a couple of times because the actors were literally taking their hands off of the wheel and just like grabbing onto stuff, you know, hanging on for dear life. (laughs) Oh man, that's hilarious. Uh, it's super funny. I'll have to find the interview where he's talking about it and put it up sometime. It, people, people listen to this are really going to appreciate it. It's super funny. I'd love to see that. That, need, that needs to be a segment is like, um, you know, sticking celebrities in a car with a, uh, like a professional drifter um, <laughs> and just <laughs> seeing them go out of character from anything you've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> you know what we should do instead of actors, we should do rappers. <laughs> Just like these super tough ballers just crying <laughs> yeah. their heads off. Exactly, man. Like iced tea type of people, you know. Ain't nothing going to get to uh, me. I, I run this. <laughs> and then they're just ah, trying to kill I me. I think iced tea would work particularly well. <laughs> Who's the one that just I've got seen... deported to England? Um, I want to... It's one of those new mumble rap people, <laughs> mumble rap. really skinny. Um, they have lots of tattoos on it. I think six nine or something like that. 
Um, mm. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a good person to ask for this. I, think, I bet I'd know him if I saw his face. I think the 6-9 one went to jail for soliciting a minor or something like that. Oh, wow. They're just, they're just dropping like flies. Yeah, they're really dragging the bottom. I, I think now is a good time for you to become like a SoundCloud rapper because they've proved that just about anybody can do it. Yeah. I'm just it's saying. Just, they're getting pumped out like a factory. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Exactly, dude. Exactly. All right, brother man. Well, um, I have taken up enough of your precious time. I do appreciate you calling in. And uh, what are you working Anytime. on? Anytime. What are you working on these days? Let's see. Um, right now, we have a few features in the summer. Um, actually, that's another thing while you're talking about. Um Getting Cars Right is working on a, a, a period 1930s movie in um, Centralia, Washington this summer. And I've never done a period thing before, but that's another thing where you probably, you're probably going to need to locate a few experts to make sure everything is, um, you know, period correct, especially their, their clothing. Mm, mm. I got your guy for the cars. I got your guy. He might be calling in a little bit later on. He was texting me uh, when I put out that we we're doing a call-in show. So I might have an expert for you. We'll see how that shakes out, okay? Ooh, awesome. That'd be cool to hear. Yeah, man. He, he's he got a podcast himself, and I'll, I'll, pl- I'll put the name of it in post. I forget what it is right now, but uh, he... Uh, he has a really good show, and he and his co-host go into historic automobiles. I mean, right up my alley. I love this stuff, and uh, uh, I think he would be. I think he'd be perfect for you. Unfortunately, he's on the West Coast, so won't be any uh, time uh, issues. Nice. Um, I'd be cool to hear from about. Um, I just I just saw the new Bugatti. That's going to be like fifteen million dollars. I was just thinking, wow, they've Bugatti's really come a long way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah yeah man uh bugatti is uh yeah it's something else now it is something else you know what's weird is i saw and i'm trying to remember what season top gear this was it was one of the last seasons Uh richard hammond i think it was richard hammond raced a mclaren Uh f1 against a a bugatti veyron (laughs) and the mclaren f1 actually had the bugatti veyron until like 180 miles an hour and then the bugatti finally caught up it was pretty wild wow that's insane because the the f1 is so like you know it was it was the fastest car one time and it was it was so expensive and but it's it was kind of old now and it's crazy to hear that it keeps up so well i know dude it's ancient technology it's super bizarre to see that it's just still competing at that high level and you know it's got that six liter single overhead cam uh bmw v12 in it so i mean it's nothing special you can get those motors out of the junkyard for a thousand bucks but it just it's a good engine it's a really good car design and yeah it has stood the test of time um yeah that's that's definitely up there with my dream cars up there huh what's what's the one top (laughs) I don't know. I'm trying to think if there's any other cars that have like a a single front seat configuration with two behind you, but that that makes it pretty unique, huh? Among other things. Well, you just need to get one of those Homer Simpson cars. <laughs> yeah, the Homer Mobile thing. Yeah, now you're talking. <laughs> that was a driver oriented car. It sure was, man, and insulated you from the noisy kids in the back. <laughs> <laughs> good visibility that's right that's right all right boss hey thanks so much for calling really appreciate it and uh looking forward to talking to you again soon anytime yeah what did i tell you guys vincent is really <laughs> he's a hilarious dude I-, I love talking to him every time and also if you live in the pacific northwest and you have a car that's fascinating interesting i would recommend that you uh you know kind of keep your eyes open he posts in a lot of the car groups whenever he's doing a a film or commercial or a movie or whatever Uh, he's shot some tv shows and stuff where they need vehicles everybody in the industry around here knows he's a car guy and so he's kind of their go-to when it comes to finding a vehicle as a matter of fact i think right now he's looking for a black seventh gen accord i think uh 
I'll have to find it. I'll, I'll share his post out on the 3BQ Facebook page. But at any rate, if you've got a car that you think would be fitting for a movie or a show, he's always looking. And so he's a really good resource and asset to have. And I'll try to share more of his requests out on the 3BQ page so that any of you that are in the Pacific Northwest, if you've got something that fits the bill, hopefully you can make it work. I know a number of different people who have had their, their cars featured in commercials and TV shows, because if you've got it and they need it, there you go. It's perfect, you know, but salt of the earth guy, love talking to him. Hopefully we can keep doing it. And, uh, we, man had some thoughts about that fast and the furious, didn't we? I find it very interesting that they actually had to make the vault steerable in that scene. And I'm not kidding. I've never seen the movie all the way through. I know the scene that they're talking about, but it's more just because we live in that kind of world where this stuff gets shared out constantly. And, you know, you just get to see kind of bits and pieces of the movie. Heck, I might not have to go and see Captain Marvel. Like I might be able to see the whole movie just in bits and pieces as people make memes out of it. So, you know, it's just one of those things. I'm actually going to call it a money saving and a time saving effort. <laughs> You can kind of get the gist of what the movie's about. Uh, I'll tell you, though, we did watch, oh, what was it called? Mortal Engines the other day. And I didn't quite know what to expect out of this movie. It didn't do very well in the box office, and it wasn't very well received. And, uh, I mean, listen, the the plot was thin. Uh, they built up the villain, then he died just as quickly. And, I mean, just, you know, stuff like that. But visually stunning. I was very impressed with all of the visuals, all the graphics, there wasn't a single time where I felt like I was being pulled out of the movie by the CGI. It was just seamless. And I suppose you can't really expect anything less out of Peter Jackson. He did the Lord of the Ring movies, I think, although I've never seen those either. So I don't really know what to compare them to, but everybody kept saying that to me. Oh, he did the Lord of the Rings movies. And so it's going to be a good movie. And it wasn't super good, but it was visually stunning. Anyways, speaking of visually stunning, I wanted to touch on something real quick. Uh, we have a barbecue company here in Oregon. It's called Sam's Northwest Barbecue. It's a barbecue outfitter. And I I'm just in love with what this guy is doing. It's super impressive how much he fits in his shop. It is truly your one-stop shop. It's located in Sherwood, Oregon. And uh, Sam, super nice guy. The selection he has is just, uh, it's something to behold. I mean, seriously, you, you go in there and it's just, it's like a candy store for people that love barbecue stuff. So he has started carrying recently the Myron Mixer bar Q pellet smokers. And I haven't heard a whole lot about these things, but man, it is really interesting to see Myron Mixon trying to jump into the pellet smokers. And I'm really hoping for good things. You know, I don't know that much about it, like I said, but I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. And for the price, they look really well built. We're talking 14 gauge steel. We're talking double walled cook chamber. The lid pulls all the way up so you get full access to the top and everything. And they're big in size. They've got multiple racks through them. I mean, it's very impressive stuff. You know, if you if you do a lot of the pellet cooking and stuff like that, you know, you could pay their triggers out there that are $2,000. You know what I mean? And that's kind of the direction that it seems like people are going. If you want to get a really high quality pellet grill, you're looking at something over a thousand dollars. That's not always the case. You know, pit boss has some really good budget ones and stuff like that. But if you're trying to go with something that you feel like is a lifetime smoker with the, the lifetime replacement warranties and, and stuff like that, a, a bigger brand name, these are not bad. You know, they start at 1800 bucks. And so it's, it's right in there kind of with the trigger, you know, I'm thinking about the, the Timberline line and, and stuff like that. So it, it, I just found it very interesting, these, these new bar Q pellet smokers, and you go all the way up to their big, big one, bar Q 3600. That is a $3,000 smoker, but at the same time, it's so big inside, it can hold 11 hotel pans, full-sized hotel pans. And <laughs> 
I don't know, man, if you were running a catering business or you were trying to do a, a barbecue thing on the side, like, I don't know, out of your house or out of a commercial kitchen that you're running part time or something like that, man, this just seems like it, it might not be a bad way to go for the person that's transitioning from hobby barbecue into professional barbecue, if you know what I mean. Uh, two different probes. It's got a 40 pound pellet hopper. You know, it's just a, it's one of those kind of smokers that just, you could run it all day long without doing a whole lot with it. And the thing that I like about these is that you can set it and you can walk away and you can be reasonably sure that it is going to keep running without any issues, especially with those double walls in the cook chambers. You don't have to worry about the wind kicking up and then it cools the whole thing off and you didn't realize it. And it's burning through pellets faster than you thought or it can't keep temperature or whatever. You know, all of the stuff that we encounter when we have a cheaper, thinner pellet grill that's sitting out on the patio in the wind, that sort of thing. So this just seems like it would be a good bridge between that you know let's buy two three four traegers that we all have running at the same time for our catering business or that ten thousand dollar professional you know name the the company that builds it this seems like it's a good intermediate and i encourage you guys to go out there and check them out and let me know what your thoughts are i want to start getting some feedback on these things because i am really curious I'm very curious to know what people's thoughts are on these things. It's a big old smoker. It's well constructed. It's got a, a name brand on it. Everybody knows Myron Mixon, you know. As a matter of fact, I keep sitting here thinking to myself, when is like Heath Riles going to build his own smokers or something, you know? <laughs> Some of those bigger names that are out there right now in the in the barbecue world. I don't know about you, but I'd buy a Malcolm Reed smoker. I'm just saying. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> but Myron Mixon, everybody knows Myron Mixon, and he has the draw. You know, he's he's a barbecue celebrity. But all of that said and all of that aside, I don't know, man. These pellet grills look really good. I encourage you guys to go and check them out. And if you are in the Pacific Northwest and you're looking to buy one, I recommend that you come and check out Sam's Barbecue. Uh, excuse me, Sam's Northwest Barbecue here in Oregon. So that is going to be it for me, you guys. Thank you so, so much for tuning in. Thank you for telling a friend. I'm going to be giving away more shirts, so make sure you're going out there, you're liking, you're subscribing, you're throwing me a rating and a review. I always appreciate it. And it enters you automatically into that drawing for a free shirt. So be sure to go and do that for me. I appreciate it. Also, drop us a line, you know, head on over to boostboostbbq.com. We've got photos of everything we've talked about, any associated links, anything like that, directly underneath of the episode. And we've got comment section, so leave your comments there. I always like to hear them. I always like to see them. I always like to read them. So thank you so much, and we will see you next time. Boost Booze and Barbecue.